sit back and enjoy. Um, and I'll pass it to Kristen. Hi, this is Kristen Wataki. I'm the curriculum and content editor for the College Success Program, and I'll be keeping time for this webinar. And back to Katie. Great, thank you. Um, so just to kind of give you a little recap about the webinar and who we're gonna be hearing from today. Uh, the first person is Glenn Dausch. He is a College Success Program mentor, and he's also gonna be our moderator today. Glenn works as a web accessibility coordinator and usability consultant living in New York. While he doesn't see blindness as a barrier, he recognizes that no two people experience life the same way. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his family, reading and playing the guitar. He is looking forward to sharing his experiences both as a student and as a university disability services administrator. We also have, Tab have Tabitha Brecky, another CSP mentor. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Humanities and Fine Arts from the University of Wyoming, an MA in Counseling with emphasis in Rehabilitation from the University of Arkansas, and a PhD in Adult Education from Auburn University. She currently works as an Accommodation Specialist in the Office of Accessibility at Auburn. Prior to returning to school, she worked in the rehabilitation field as a rehabilitation teacher, counselor, and supervisor. The achievement of goals by students or clients that they previously thought impossible is the aspect of her career that she enjoys the most. Tabitha has many hobbies, including reading, knitting, weaving, playing harp, and singing. She is a member of the American Association of Blind Teachers, an affiliate of the American Council of the Blind, and is secretary of that organization. And finally, we also have Preston Radke, another CSP mentor. He is a web accessibility specialist at Rutgers University and a part-time lecturer in Rutgers School of Communication and Information. Advocacy and equity are the driving passions behind his life and work. In his spare time, Preston enjoys traveling, listening to records, and playing with his seeing eye dog, Burton. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Glenn to get us going. All right, thank you, Katie. And since we have a lot to get to today, we're going to jump right into the questions because I, I have a feeling uh, we're going to uh, take up all that time and we do want to save uh, some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so Preston, can you describe uh, several tips that you would give to a college student to succeed in an online academic environment? Sure. Um, thank you guys for coming to, to the um, presentation today, because I said my name is Preston Ranke, and um, some quick tips that I would give are plan ahead, um, if possible, if you, like, if you know they're, you're going to be using, like, Blackboard or Canvas, maybe try to request, like, a, a sandbox or kind of like a blank Canvas or Blackboard shell, so you kind of have the opportunity to kind of practice using it beforehand. Um, if, if that's not possible, I would just um, kind of lean on your professors and your kind of awesome, your school's disability services department and just to kind of to stay proactive with with that transition. Excellent. Thank you. And Tabitha, do you have any tips that you would offer in general to students as they transition to um, online and remote education? I, I would say really, um, you know, to, to communicate with your faculty and stay on top of things. Um, utilize things like your calendar and and apps to keep you on schedule and, and on track with what's due and and um, you know treat those classes as you would your online classes just as you would in person appointments or classes. And so, Tabitha, with respect to the the transition from in person to um, online classes. Uh, is there is there any recommendation that you would give in terms of the accommodations that students have uh, already in place uh, or, or accommodations that they may think they have in place? Um, so a lot of accommodations will carry over, for example, like time and a half on exams or, you know, your extended time. Um, a quiet testing environment is usually up to the student to arrange. But again, you want to look at your accommodations that you have talk with your disability services office um, just to make sure of how those are going to be offered and then um, you know your, your faculty because there could be some things that might might crop up um, that would be 
you know, different. And I, and I would also say, again, like if you have the attendance accommodation, let's say you have another health concern in addition to visual impairment, um, you still want to treat your, your Zoom class or your online class as you would an in-person class in how you utilize your attendance accommodation and make up for missed work, et cetera. So if, if a professor were to approach a student and, and start discussing an accommodation that hasn't been, been put in place, what uh, suggestions would you provide to the student? Um, well, to put an accommodation in place officially, at least here at Auburn, we, we put it in place with the students in the Office of Accessibility, and then the student submits it to the instructor. Um, some schools call it an, an accommodations memo. We have an online process, and I, I think most schools probably do now. And then, you know, they meet with the instructor. So if an instructor suggests something, they should, you know, go to their Office of Accessibility to see if it can be put in place. Or sometimes an instructor might do something specific um, you know, because of the uniqueness of the semester um, that wouldn't normally happen, but might um, because of the, you know, COVID situation. Excellent, thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, Preston, um, with respect to Google Meets or, or Zoom, um, are there tips that particularly apply to these platforms that you think uh, help students to be successful? Sure. Um, and this kind of will link a little bit back to my first answer or first response for the first question. Um, as with anything, um, if, you've, if you're not familiar with the Zoom or WebEx or any of these other teleconferencing platforms, I would, I, would, I would suggest maybe practicing beforehand. There's lots of kind of guides out there that provide like accessibility navigation hacks and tips. I would suggest kind of getting familiar with those. Um, if you have access to someone who has like a Zoom or a WebEx account, I would maybe suggest asking them if you could potentially practice navigating with them. Um, many colleges provide their students with free Zoom accounts, so that may you may not even have to kind of go through someone else in that regard. Um, one major thing to keep in mind uh, that I think gets forgotten about is Zoom, WebEx, Teams, Slack, what have you, all these different teleconference, teleconferencing platforms look very differently depending on device and kind of medium. So like I'm using Zoom right now on the desktop client. Um, however, if I was to look at Zoom on my phone or just on the, on the web, the navigation could be, could be slightly different, the capabilities could be slightly different. So I'd really highly recommend getting, trying to get familiar with the nature of all the different um, platforms because there are, uh, for instance, in some, on some teleconferencing platforms, you can't share a screen on mobile or you can't access the chat in different modalities. So it's always, it's always good to kind of be prepared and kind of proactively go about um, learning these, these tools. Excellent, thank you. And Tabitha, do you have any, any thoughts for students uh, to succeed using a remote communication platform like Zoom or Google Teams? I mean, um, Microsoft Teams or Google Meet? <laughs> um, no, just really, um, there, there are, you know, lists of key commands that you can find um, by, you know, Googling them. And I, I would recommend, you know, until you're really familiar, maybe keeping, keeping a cheat sheet close at hand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, that's that's a great tip, though, you know, because you're not going to remember every key command and yeah. uh, or if you switch platforms like like Preston was suggesting earlier, uh, like I do regularly, the, the mm -hmm. Mac commands are different from the Windows commands and you're yeah. you'll be playing, uh, you know, musical Tetris with your fingers. So yeah. um, a couple of other tips I, I just wanted to bring to the the uh, floor in case uh, these come up for anyone. Um, always remember to mute your video, uh, mute your microphone and turn off your video um, by default. That way, when you join a room, uh, you have the ability to control what other people hear and or see. Um, and if you are not the person speaking, please remember to mute your microphone. That's always a, an important tip. Um, so it helps the conversation move along. Um, do you mind if I actually jump in with one more quick tip, Glenn? Of, of course. So, yeah, so 
the idea of shared content on Zoom or WebEx, I know it happens a lot in classes, like professors will share a screen, they'll share like a, I don't know, a worksheet that, that they want the students to look at. And of course, as you guys may know, in many cases that is not accessible to, um, to, to users, to individuals, individuals who use screen readers. So I'd recommend kind of proactive workarounds, maybe asking the instructor if you could have that document sent to you beforehand um, or just maybe posting the link to that website like in the chat or sharing it with you before and just so you can have some bit of a more equitable experience you know because sometimes shared content is not <laughs> possible for you to view as someone who uses a screen reader. Yeah that's a, that's a great tip. Um, the, the other tip that I had that I, I wanted to pass along a lot of these tools like Zoom or, or Google Meets uh, or um, Microsoft Teams allow you to record your mm -hmm. your meetings. Um, if your professor allows that, it's certainly and you have the accommodation. Uh, it's certainly a good practice to get um, into in that if you uh, miss content, you can go back and review it. But the other tip here is you can use that recording, set up a, a practice meeting like Preston suggested and use that recording to gauge how you sound on the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, are people able to hear you? Are you showing up in camera? Um, you can, uh, we'll, we'll cover some tips for that later in, in the session, but um, I think those are, are really great starting points. Um, Tabitha, can you tell me some of your favorite apps uh, to recommend for college students? Uh, to enhance their success, oh, especially in the online environment? Sure, I, I love my iPhone, so I'm always using <laughs> Um I'm a major reader, so some of my favorites, of course, you know, are, are like Bard and Learning Ally. When I was a student, Learning Ally, um, the app, um, the Read to Go or um, Voice Stream Reader. And then I use like uh, Seeing AI, um, for identifying things or reading quick package directions, those kind of, you know, either scanning barcodes or reading packages. Um, IRA, where you can call in for that free five minute, you know, call might be just all you need to, if you can't figure out what something is or need, you know, that little bit of help, those, those kinds of apps are some of my favorites. Okay. Preston, do you have any, uh, any favorites that you think um, helpful for students? Uh, the calendar app. Um, I love the <laughs> calendar app. This, I, I loved it when I was a student. I love it when I am uh, like a working professional now. It's great for, you know, you have a lot going on as a student. You're a massive time, time of transition, be it coming into college or going into the workforce. You have lots of things to remember. So it's just a great way to, you know, keep track of meetings you have to go to, assignments, classes. I, I love the calendar app. Um, Kind of ducktailing off that, Be My Eyes, which is very similar to Ira. It's, um, it's also kind of a, it's a volunteer, it's a, it's a free app where you can um, link up with a volunteer and they can kind of assist you with what you're trying to look at. That could be really useful for some individuals who, who maybe they live on their own. And like I, what I used it when I was on my own because I needed help, like learning the new laundry machine in my apartment. So it kind of could be something as simple as that, or you know, some if you have if you need assistance finding something like when you're walking around. So, but I, my my main answer is the calendar. I I I, I am tied to the calendar. Can Speaking is oh oh go ahead, Tabitha. Sure. Sorry, um, one that I found really useful is the Translock Rider app, and and different colleges may use different ones, but so that you can track the buses. So if you use mm. the university's bus system. That's a good point. That one is very useful because I can find my route and then know you can, you know, find out where it is. Like I can pull up the stops and it'll tell me how far it is from my stop and when the next one should be there. So those kind of apps are good to learn to use too if, you, if you've got that option. Absolutely. And, and as somebody who, like Preston, is, is sort of tied to their calendar, um, I'll, I'll third that, that option, uh, you know, if it if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist is my my saying. Um, the a couple of other apps I'd like to throw in here. Um, 
like Tabitha suggested, her campus has a transportation app. I know my campus also has yeah, uh, apps for food services and things like that. So the menus are more accessible in, in those places. Um, and so continuing on that theme of trying different platforms for different methods of access, um, I tend to use the Google Drive app a lot if I have to move uh, a large number of files. I just, I prefer the iOS interface uh, to the keyboard interface. So um, find the, you know, the platform that works for you. Try different, uh, different platforms like, like Preston suggested earlier. And, um, you know, just because you're, you've used that app on Windows or you've used that app on iOS or Android, um, you may have a different experience when you switch platforms. So, um, Tabitha, are there any note-taking programs or services that you would recommend for students uh, using online or, or engaging in online learning? Sure, well, a lot of students right now, um, because our university records, they require that the professors record classes. So right now, a lot of students are using those recordings and then like if they get copies of instructor materials or the PowerPoints. Um, we also have access to Glean, which is an app by a company called Sonicent. And if you use the Google Chrome browser, it allows a person to record class and then type notes at the same time the recording is happening and it synchronizes the recording with the notes. And you can also put in labels of what's important. Now, I'm, I'm pretty certain of its accessibility for people with low vision. I have not had a chance, I was hoping to today, to get to test it as far as for uh, folks without vision. They say it's accessible. Now, we know how we have to always kind of check that for ourselves when people tell us things are accessible because sometimes they technically are, but they're not necessarily user friendly. So I wish I could give you more on that, but um, a lot of students do like that app. Okay, Preston, do you have any um, apps that you wanna add or services? No, I think, I, I think Tabitha really covered it there. I would kind of get another opportunity just to lean on your kind of accessible or Office of Disability Services Department um, for note-taking assistance. Um, they, they're still there, even though, you know, we are all kind of remote. I, I really want to emphasize that point. Um, all of the resources that mm -hmm. you use you know, in a virtual environment are still, uh, in a physical environment, are still available in the virtual environment. They may change a little bit, and we'll come to that in, in a little bit, but um, definitely. Still a couple of other uh, suggestions I have. Um, if you're using Android, uh, the Android uh, voice recorder does um, automated transcription of uh, the recorded speech. Um, so it is Eh, not the most accurate, but, uh, you know, for free uh, on board your device, it's pretty good. Um, another service like that uh, is called Otter. Um, and then the other service uh, similar to that on iOS, there's an app called Just Press Record um, that also provides uh, transcripts of your recordings. Um, all of these have the caveat that the transcript is only as good as the recording source. So if you're in, uh, you know, far away from the lecturer, um, your recording uh, transcript quality will significantly be degraded. Um, so coming back to that point that we were talking about earlier, um, what, what are some resources uh, that you would recommend either online or in person um, that students turn to uh, to enhance their success? And Preston, we'll start with you. Sure, so um, kind of spinning off of the whole, you know, the, the ODS office is still there. Like all your student services are still there in a virtual capacity. So be it like tutoring services, um, you know, some the, the career center, there's the counseling services, they're all still there. Um, they're, all, all, they're all there to assist um, all the students at the university. Um, that also goes for like student clubs and organization. Um, may not strictly academic, but you know, they like to say, you know, the 
it's good to be kind of well balanced in that re regard. So, you know, to get the full college experience to go to these student organizations and they're all, all meeting virtually as well. Um, so my main answer is mainly focusing on kind of still leaning on those plentiful resources within the university. Um, granted, many of them may not deliver the exact same experiences if you are there in person, but they are still providing those kind of invaluable sources for everyone. Okay. Um, are there resources outside of the college environment that you think students um, might want to avail themselves of or? Um... Um, so there's always, there's always learning ally, you know, there's always <laughs> us, the, the mentors, we're more than willing to assist you in pretty, pretty much, we're, we're here to assist you in college and kind of your transition. So always lean on us. Um, I would suggest lean on like your voc rehabilitation service office for, you know, any more career based or financial based questions you may have. Um, and of course there's lots of kind of outside the classroom kind of tutoring services available. Like for instance, many universities offer like free LinkedIn learning subscriptions to their, their students. So that is another great resource if maybe you want help in a certain area that you're, that's not being covered in class. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's lots out there. Excellent. Yeah, I agree with you. Definitely look into the resources that your, your school offers to students uh, for free because many of, uh, many of those resources go untapped. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's definitely not an opportunity you, you want to pass up if you're getting something that you're yeah, already paying for. It's not, it's not going to be as easy in the real well, you know, when you're out of college. Um, Tabitha, are, are there resources that you direct students to, whether online or in person, um, that you think would be helpful for their success as students? You know, one um, would be e each of the consumer groups, both ACB and NFB, have student divisions. Um, and they also have organizations for professionals within certain, like, for example, we have a teacher's affiliate. Um, or th there's, you know, people in the arts or, you know, different things like that, that each organization has that might be able to be a support and a resource uh, for you. So those were, those were some that I, I was thinking of. Um, Absolutely. I, I will put my, my old career hat on and say that if you're a user of assistive technology, um, don't pass up the opportunity uh, to, to look for information on the technologies that you're using, whether it's documentation from their website um, or user groups, um, or even like Tabitha was suggesting, uh, student groups from ACB or NFB. Um, if you're interested in, in science or the arts, there are, uh, likewise, there are divisions that are, are dedicated to those pursuits. Um, so finding, uh, you know, other groups that, that share your interests or that share the technologies that you're using uh, are another great resource to uh, gain additional information. And there are some great, sorry, Glenn, um, like Apple Viz, if you're an Apple user. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to, I don't know the Windows one as much, but just some of those kind of websites too can be great resources for the technology stuff where you can find things. Yeah, and there's, there's lots of um, very interesting kind of going back to kind of accessibility and kind of assistive technology. There's lots of like Facebook groups and kind of email list serves that um, let's say you have a question about a certain application, if it's accessible or not, or how to navigate that you can pose a, pose a question in and, you know, more often than not, you can discover kind of a, an answer that you had not really thought of before because of the, the community of experts within that group. Absolutely. Um, and you can turn around and share your knowledge, which mm -hmm. uh, is a, a great way to build, uh, you know, experience uh, right. as you start out in your career. All right. Um, Tabitha, can you talk a little bit, I know we touched on this earlier, but can you talk about how um, in-person accommodations change in the online environment and what your experience has been? So the in-person accommodations um, are still available in most 
cases on online. Now they may change or how they're offered might change, but you still are entitled, um, for example, if you, if you receive testing accommodations or if you receive um, you know, some sort of note-taking assistance. Now it may change, for example, right now, since everyone at Auburn pretty much has access to the professor recordings, we're not using student note takers as much for people because they have access to that information. Now there are a few exceptions, but, um, but th those kinds of things. The, the thing that you have to really do is think through and, and don't be hesitant to ask for assistance thinking through, okay, this is what the task is now. How am I going to complete it? How am I going to get my accommodations and and really communicating with your disability resource office and your faculty is the is the thing I would say and do that well in advance because you don't want to be the morning of the test and you haven't made arrangements and then you're sort of stuck. You know. Absolutely. Um, one of the, the one of the things that comes to mind for me is that you know, we're, we're using many more tools and, uh, you know, different platforms to accomplish the same task. Um, Preston, have you seen um, any changes in terms of the way that uh, the accessibility of these tools is being presented to students or, or how would you suggest a student find information on uh, the accessibility of a particular tool that uh, they might be using now sure. that they weren't using uh, six months ago. Right. So I would I would first um, approach your next kind of going back to the Office of Disability Services um, if you do have any concern about that tool, um, and then work with them, and then they may kind of loop in the instructor of the class in question or the instructional designer, um, and if if you guys aren't able to come to you know an equitable or an accessible solution, there may be like a recommendation of an alternative tool. Um, kind of speaking more independently, like I said earlier, there's there's lots of great kind of online resources that give kind of reviews and kind of different tips for navigating new pieces of technology. Um, if you really want to get kind of deep down into the weeds of it, I would honestly recommend reaching out to kind of a representative or a developer of said technology um, because many times if, if there's a product that's inherently not accessible it was mainly made inaccessibly because frankly they the person developing it didn't consider the needs of someone who's disabled um, so many times in my in my work when I've had to reach out to to developers or, or creators in that regard, they're almost very kind of taken aback and some of them are honestly look at it as like an opportunity to um, improve their own app from your feedback. And hopefully, hopefully you don't get to that point. Hopefully they can give you kind of more pointers as to how to more effectively navigate the, the experience though. Excellent. I'll sort of tie that loop together and say that um, I know uh, Tabitha and, and Preston both mentioned AppleViz earlier. There is a guide on their website um, to having that conversation with developers that is specific mm -hmm. to iOS. Um, so it points to resources and other things that are available mm -hmm. for developers. But it's also just a, a great way to see how to guide that conversation and right. um, what information you may want to provide to the developer. Um, so thank you. That, that's a great point. Um, Preston, how can students effectively communicate with their professors about their accommodations, especially uh, now that they're online, so it's a, a little bit harder to have yeah. that face-to-face -face conversation? Sure, sure. Um, well, even though we are online, that, that, that's, that only just further reemphasizes the point that communication with your instructors is, is so vitally important. Um, there are honestly some instances where I went directly to, when I was a student, there are honestly many instances where I just went directly to the professor to kind of iron out accommodations and I didn't actually go through my Office of Disability Services. I'm not saying that you should exactly do that, but it sometimes, sometimes I was able to get better accommodations out of working directly with the professor as opposed to kind of, you know, having to go through kind of a third party. Um, so I would honestly just say, please be very upfront with the professor. Um, I know 
sometimes professors can be a little kind of stodgy and kind of set in their ways with regards to how things work and in regards to like granting accommodations and whatnot. But I've generally found that more often than not, professors do have the kind of best interest of the students and they would honestly just appreciate kind of honesty and kind of being upfront. Um, I obviously never had to take remote online classes, but I would always contact my professors the semester, like the, at the end of the semester prior, just to discuss future accommodations. And I would just really recommend that now and just making sure to build that rapport so that if something does come up that is inaccessible, you don't feel uncomfortable talking to them about it. And they're like, oh, I've never, we never talked about this before. Like, how do I, I didn't, never, I didn't know that you had a disability. So just, just be proactive and kind of be willing to open those channels of communication. Excellent. Thanks. And I, I would say that on the campus where I work, I think it uh, is strongly encouraged for students to go through the DSO. So, you know, sort of understand what works in, uh, on mm -hmm. your campus. Um, right. That is very important. Um, Tabitha, do you have any uh, tips for students that uh, you know, would help them to effectively communicate with their professors, uh, especially considering that we're all working remotely? Um. Well, each faculty member, at least at Auburn, has to put their, you know, contact information in their, you know, in their syllabus um, so that you can find them. Also, they have office hours. So utilize that. And it also doesn't hurt to, um, if there are certain issues you need to talk about, make a list beforehand so that mm. when you have whatever conversation that you can be organized and go, oh, drat, I, you know, don't have to go, I forgot, you know, what was I going to ask you? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to do that later. So, so being organized about that and, um, and just understanding too, that if an instructor says, I can't do that until you talk to the Office of Accessibility, they're not necessarily saying they don't want to help yeah. you, but rather they want to be fair and that they yeah. want to make sure that what they're doing isn't going to get them in trouble. Because a lot of faculty are afraid mm -hmm. if they do something, they will or won't get in trouble. You know, they either have to do something or they don't have to do something. So sometimes when you get that kind of response, it doesn't mean they don't want to help you or they're trying to put you off. It just literally does mean that they need to have clarification on what to do. So two, two excellent points that I, I want to follow up on. Um, Tabitha. And it, first is that when, when you communicate with professors and you've put that list together, I always use that list as sort of uh, my own uh, record keeping. So as we go through the questions on my list, I, I write down the answers. It gives me a record of knowing exactly what we talked about, what their response was. Um, if it's a phone conversation or a, a Zoom meeting, I follow up with an email detailing the questions and their answers. Um, that way it gives the professor any chance uh, to clear up any, uh, you know, uh, misunderstanding or information that, may, you know, they might have thought about after the fact, because as we all know, you'll have a conversation and five minutes after the person's walked out the door, you go, oh, I wanted to mention that. So, um, that's a, that's another tip. It also gives you a written record of that conversation. Um, and that way, if there is a question down the line, you can go back to that. Um, so Tabitha, do you have any tips for students uh, working in groups now that we're all working remotely? Working in groups. Um, you know, I would, I would say um, you, you can work in groups online. It is doable. It can be a little more cumbersome, but um, again, it's I think a question of being clear about communication, who's doing what, and being organized, so that when you come to group meetings, y you have um, a clear I don't want to say agenda, but maybe that is the best word of, of what you want to get accomplished, and um, have your stuff accomplished so that you're not. Um, um, you know, everybody's not dragging along or not getting things accomplished, you know, in a, an efficient way. Um, and then it, play to your own strengths. You know, if you're not the best at formatting documents, maybe maybe you choose to do the, um, you know, something else, like, you know, some of the writing or, you know, different people can divide up the task, but but try to, you know, do your fair share, obviously. Um, but, but um, 
take on the things that you feel like you do best. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I may add is um, sure. I've, I've heard this a lot from some students is that they're, they're a little awkward. They feel awkward being like, Oh, should I tell my group members that I'm blind or something? And, and if I, if I do, how do I do that in kind of a group setting? Because, you know, as opposed to if they're in person, everyone knows that, Oh yeah, the person can't see. And the main reason why they bring this up is if there's any, like, you know, any work to be done in the group that is inaccessible or can be better done by someone who has vision perhaps. And my, I would never tell them to not to disclose or to not disclose, but I would just say in those situations, you, you know, there are some assignments that you may not ever need to tell your other classmates that you have a visual impairment. Um, but there also may be some inst instances where you may have to have an honest conversation saying that, you know, I have to, I'd, I'd prefer to not do the formatting of this just because, you know, I I have trouble reviewing the different fonts and what's bold and what's not, et cetera. Um, and I completely emphasize that maybe that could be awkward for some people. And, but I will say more often than not, the other students appreciate the honesty. And if that, in, in that regard, it's, that will make your assignment turn out for the better in the long run. I, I agree. And I think the, you know, the point there, like uh, just to reiterate what Tabitha was saying uh, as well, um, you know, when you have that conversation, mm -hmm. um, it's important to think about here's what I am contributing. And so you're mm -hmm. not phrasing it as here's what I can't do. Right. Um, you know, but you're, you're giving the other students uh, the opportunity to, to, really share in, in all of the work. The other thing to think about is, while this conversation is certainly difficult to have for, for some people, um, it's, it's your time in college and having this conversation now is good practice oh, yeah. for when you enter the working world oh, and, yeah. and have to have that conversation during a job interview or, or shortly thereafter. Right. And so, um, you know, think of it as an opportunity to gain experience in having that conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, we have uh, time for one more uh, quick question, and this is not at all a quick question. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, in fact, a three-parter. Um, and a uh, question came in, how, do, how can you gain access to tactile graphics, uh, learn more about SPSS, and what is the best way to get comfortable with, yeah, with using your screen reader? Uh, so Preston, I'll, I'll let you take uh, <laughs> the end part and then yes, uh, I'll, I'll take part three <laughs> i would mainly suggest practice honestly i feel like i've said this many times today but if you have access to a screen reader be it jaws um bda voiceover um what have you um, i would just if you can just try to practice in different scenarios like reading word documents navigating kind of dynamic websites um I'm not gonna lie, sometimes learning new screen readers can be kind of a challenge, especially if you have been stuck on using one for the longest time. Like for instance, for myself, I was a JAWS user for basically all of my high school and early college career, but then I switched to Mac. And for those of you who use voiceover on the Mac, you know it could be, the setup is a little different but with like the keystroke configurations, like all the keys you have to press. So I would just suggest practice um, like, all the other tools I talked about, there's lots of great resources out there for learning um, navigation hacks for these different screen readers. So I'd just lean on lean on us, your mentors, and kind of practice and um, use those online resources. The, the other tip I'll add real quickly is open a blank document uh, and learn your screen reader's uh, keyboard help command. Whether, oh, that's a great, yeah. Uh, you know, insert F1 for JAWS and NVDA or uh, uh, control option K for voiceover, I think. Um, and and play around the keyboard. It will tell you what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, there there's no mistake that can't be undone. Um, that is a, a very valuable tip. Um, Tabitha, do you have any, any thoughts on any part of those questions? Oh, sure. Um, just, you know, the only thing about part three too is that a lot of the screen readers do have built-in tutorials that you can walk mm -hmm. through. Sure, um, absolutely. Within themselves, so you don't have to just try to figure out how am I going to practice. And we all love reading manuals, but you know they're they're there, um, and and they usually are are helpful. As far as SPSS goes, and that is a statistical package that's used in the social sciences. 
for research. Um, when I was doing my doctorate, it was sometimes accessible and sometimes not. And there were variables that affected this. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because these could affect you and there are things that you might have to deal with. So it could be that the screen reader is out of date, you know, your version. Um, so, so my recommendation is always, always be using as much as you can afford the latest version of your. Oh screen. yes. Because if you're using JAWS 14 or whatever, and we're on 20, um, that's probably not going to work with the newest versions of browsers. Um, sometimes you have to check whether the browser is the issue, or whether, you know, it's the software itself. So, um, and you know, just the technical requirements of your computer. So for using SPSS though, I would, I would check with them um, and uh, as far as current accessibility, because I've not used it. I think, um, you, Glenn, weren't you saying R is more accessible than SPSS? Yeah, so my, my experience with SPSS, um, similar to Tabitha, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, and so I typically recommend that students where possible use R. Um, it can be driven through a command line interface. So if you are uh, looking to get access to the data, uh, it's, it's much more accessible. Um, but you know, reach out to your vendors like Preston and, and Tabitha both said earlier, um, reach out to Freedom Scientific or, or um, IBM for SPSS and it, they will be able to direct you in the way that, that allows you to gain as much access as that software has available. Um, as far as tactile graphics, um, without having access to an embosser, I'm, I'm not sure I'm aware of a, a solution. Um, it may be that your disability services office can braille the materials out and mail them to you or allow you to come in and pick them up, you know, if you're near campus. Um, yeah or send you a BRF file if you have access to an embosser or, or, you know, like maybe your device has one or, you know, something. The only thing that, um, that sort of comes to mind uh, if you have access, somebody has access to it, like a tactile drawing kit or a, mm -hmm. a sensational board or something like that, uh, where you can have somebody draw on paper. I know it's, you know, not the easiest thing to do um, and does require a little bit of artistic skill, uh, none of which I possess. Uh, but that, that might be um, another way that they can, you know, then mail that rendering to you. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, so Abigail, Katie, I'm not sure who's reading. Yeah. Chat. Uh, so just a bit of instructions for folks. If you are joining from Zoom, feel free to raise your hand on the PC, it's Alt-Y. Mm -hmm. From a Mac, it's Option-Y. If you're calling in, you can press star nine and we'll um, you know, take questions as many as we can get in the order that they come in with the time that we have. There was one thing posted in the chat earlier when you all were talking about apps and someone wanted to clarify the spelling of, if it's Glean with an N for Nancy or Gleam uh, and for morning. A uh, glean as an N G L E A N as an N for Nancy. Yeah. And it's awesome. Produced by Sonocent is the uh, company that makes it. And that's, uh, was it S O N O C E N T, I believe. I think so. <laughs> Otherwise, we haven't had two. Uh, I don't know that we've had any other questions come in through our chat. You know, I have one other um, little pointer too. Each of um, Apple and Microsoft have accessibility phone numbers. And so if you're in a situation where you're using software, your, your iPhone's doing something weird or whatever, that can be a good uh, first step and, you know, to try to problem solve. And thank you, Tabitha, because that reminded me when, when Preston was mentioning Be My Eyes, um, the both Microsoft and Google disability uh, support desks 
are available on Be My Eyes. Uh, so you can use using your phone, call in and have them take a look at either, you know, a, a Word or Google document that's not working for you, or, or if you're encountering an accessibility challenge with a particular app. Um, and as as a college student, um, you know, you, you don't want to pass up any resources that are available to you. So. We did have in the chat, someone um, wanted to know any suggestions you might have for someone that has to switch screen readers midway through their semester. And I uh, you know Preston was talking about it. And I would, as someone who is a screen reader user myself, uh, as Glenn mentioned, the, Google has a well. Abigail, I think, think you're cutting out various products on this. Okay, so I, I think we're, we're losing I'll Abigail. Um, I, I, I'll try to pick up where Abigail left off. Um, you know, if you're switching screen readers, um, you know, there are, there are a number of resources, whether they're on user groups, uh, on either Google groups or, or other um, platforms. Uh, that you can turn to, uh, go back to the manufacturer's documentation, like um, Tabitha said earlier, um, you know, the manuals are, are there for a reason. Um, but use the tutorials that are built into to the software. Um, and like Preston said, experiment a little bit. Um, there are, you know, there are, are, look at the tasks that you're doing and, and try to set up, uh, you know, templates that you can play around with, whether it's a, a blank document in Google Docs or a, a blank Word document or, um, you know, set up an email address where you're emailing yourself um, and you can get practice working with, with those tools um, after you've, you know, thoroughly digested the manual and, and whatever tutorials are available. Not sure if we still have Abigail or not, but we need yeah, to I'm more trying questions. to pull up the chat. Oh, yeah. thanks, thanks, Katie. If you could read those, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so we have one. Do you have any advice for online homework platforms like WebAssign? Specifically, much of the online math content is displayed as a graphic and not using MathML. Um, Preston or Tabitha, do you want to take this one? I can, I can jump in if you're. I was gonna, I was gonna say if you will jump in because right now. Yep. I don't have sure. To yeah. Take it, Glenn. Okay. So uh, specifically with respect to WebAssign, um, I, I would have a conversation with your disability services office. Um, there are specific problem sets that are known to be accessible and there are specific problem sets that are known not to be accessible. Um, and your instructor uh, may have to, um, select the problems that, uh, you know, that fall within the accessible range. Um, that's really going to be your best option uh, as far as uh, web assign. Um, you know, there's, there's not much you can do if, if the image is entirely graphical, it's not going to be accessible. Great. Thanks, there's Katie. One, there's one more question, um, and it is, what is R? Which I believe some, one of you had mentioned that. Yep. Uh, so R is a statistical package, um, and it is a cross-platform um, package that is a really high-level statistics if you're doing either graduate work in, in math or the social sciences um, that allows you to uh, compile and, and compute your data and just uh, display it um, in any number of graphical formats. Now, is, is it just literally the letter R, or is it spelled A R A R E? Is, isn't it a, is it A R R? Oh, yeah, A R R. It, it, it's rproject.org. I'm I'm actually looking it up I, as we <laughs> speak. Yeah, I can't, I've never <laughs> used it, um, but I, I'm glad to know that it is accessible because I'd like to do some more research in the future and knowing that there is an accessible option that's more consistent than SPSS is a good thing. So you see, even even we all learn. No matter if we're professionals in the field, we still keep learning. Yeah. That's my other piece of advice is just as, don't ever think that you've 
learned all about a piece of technology or about <laughs> any of it because it'll always change on you and you'll learn new things. Definitely. Um, and it is just R as in the letter R. Oh, it okay. is. Okay. It looks like we have somebody um, who's raised their hand. Uh, Daniela Alvarado, Alvarado, maybe you want to go ahead and ask your question. If you can unmute. And while Daniela is doing that, it is r-project.org. That's the URL. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm from Alamo Gordo, and I was just wondering, what more can I do to learn more about Zoom, like different platforms and all that, besides finding somebody who knows how to use it? For Zoom, um, the Carroll Center out of Boston recently put out a book that they're selling and it comes in different formats. So you could get it as like a Word document. And that book, um, I don't think is terribly expensive. I, I think it'd be like 25 or less. You'd have to contact them. Another one, Jonathan Mosen um, did a free audio book that he was allowing people to download. It's a few years old, but it would cover the basics. And I don't know, Glenn, do you happen to have? The title, it is Meet Me Accessibly. Oh, um, yeah. And it is available for free on his website, which is mosen, M-O-S-E-N.org. One quick thing I'd like to add about Zoom is, Zoom is really, I, I frankly love Zoom, but the, the one thing that's really helpful about Zoom is um, if, you, if you just tab around or navigate around, many times when you land on a button, it will actually read out the, the, like the, the keystroke to get to it quicker. So like if I'm tabbing to the mute button, it'll say, you know, mute or mute, you're currently unmuted or whatever. And they'll say like alt plus A. Um, so it's pretty intuitive it, just to learn like kind of like the basic commands as well in that regard. And the other, the other resource, um, like we'd, mentioned earlier um you know zoom's website has a list of all the shortcut uh commands that they support mm -hmm. um and so that is that's another uh resource that i'd uh, avail yourself of and just just try to you know learn the ones that are pertinent for you you may not be screen sharing and so um you know but raising your hand and muting your microphone turning on um and abigail thank you for dropping the link in the chat um so excellent are there any other um so it doesn't look like we have any more questions um or raised hands i'll give everybody a few more minutes if they have any more questions but while people are thinking about that i just wanted to mention a few things as far as uh learning ally and the college success program go um this as I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, but if, in case you came on a little bit later, this is the first in a three-part series of webinars that all focus on navigating the coronavirus landscape. Uh, this was the first one around college academics. Uh, next month and the following month, we will have another webinar um, each of those months. One will be about kind of uh, professionalism and how that stuff is working, how, how to deal with uh, professional uh, situations and then also one that's just more around like social activities and things like that. So be on the lookout for information about registering uh, for those webinars. And I also wanted to um, mention we still have our Learning Ally still has our National Achievement Awards open right now which is a scholarship opportunity. Um, so there is one specifically for students, you must be a Learning Ally member, um, but completing an undergrad or graduate degree and are blind or visually impaired. So I would suggest that if you fall into that category, maybe check out um, our the award opportunity and see if it's something you would like to go for. Uh, I believe a scholarship of up to $6,000 is available for that one. And um, of course, you know, if you have more questions, if you want more information, you can always reach out to us. Uh, you can visit us on Facebook or Twitter, um, email us at csp at learningally.org. Um, and as all the mentors mentioned earlier, we, we have plenty of mentors on, on hand to be helping people, especially during this, this time and all the different new situations we all have to deal with. Um, so it's great to, to tap Katie, into if, those. Katie, if I might, so, uh, there are two quick questions yeah. that came in. Um, 
So uh, the first question is, how do I make sure that uh, my speech is muted uh, or my microphone is muted and my video is off when I come into a Zoom meeting? Um, so th that is a setting within Zoom. If you go into the Zoom application um, on your home tab, which is the first tab that you'll land in when you start Zoom, if you're on the Mac or the PC, um, go into uh, the menu and select settings. And on the, um, uh, in the settings, you'll, you'll see uh, checkboxes uh, that both say uh, start my meetings with video on or, or off and start with my microphone on or off. Um, and you'll uncheck those as, as needed. Um, Preston, do you have, have you done this in the iPhone? Because I'm not sure. Not. No, okay. I haven't, unfortunately. Um, I know it's available in the iPhone, uh, but it, I said it so long ago, I yeah. honestly don't remember where it is. Um, I want to say it's in the More tab uh, under the iPhone, but I I don't have the app open. Um, the other question we had is, how do I get uh, Zoom installed on my Braille Note Touch? Unfortunately, I am uh, not that familiar with the Braille Note Touch, other than knowing it is somewhat of an Android uh, device. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would recommend contacting Humanware and, and seeing what suggestions they offer. Uh, the other thing to try is use, use the web version of Zoom and see if that will work for you. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to let um, everyone know that um, for Blackboard or for universities that use Blackboard, instructors can create, can actually, they have the ability to, if you have a timed exam, they can grant the extension only for you yeah. or for the student. Yes, that yes, is true. Mm -hmm. I yeah, didn't both. know if people were aware of that, but I, as a, as a graduate student who takes courses on, uh, online, um, I, you know, that's, that's what they've done uh, for me. And they usually give extensions on uh, projects and assignments up to a week. Excellent. Thanks. You're welcome. I, I have one other um, little resource for people too. If um, the National Braille Press, so that's N as in Nancy, B as in Bravo, P dot org, oh. do a lot of technology books and command summaries that you can not only order in Braille, but if you want it in like Word format or BRF, things like that. And I found those to be really handy. I like having things in Braille. So even if I'm using a computer or whatever, I, I like having those little command summaries or cheat sheets or books about how to use different um, products and operating systems. So that's another place to find some good materials. Excellent. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, as um, Katie mentioned earlier, this recording will be posted um, and shared out later. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Katie. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Um, if, if anybody has any additional questions, again, you can, can reach out to us and uh, we'll be happy to, to get some answers to you. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. We hope you found it all beneficial and we hope to, to have you on our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you guys.